So today we're going to discuss the really critically important history of King Ashoka and ways in which it can be of great benefit to, to study today. Coming right up. So I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association. That's secularbuddhism.org. If you're new to the channel and interested in living a, a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled life, consider subscribing. So King Ashoka was born about a century after the Buddha's death. So he lived from about 304 to 239 BCE, and he ruled from about 268 to 239 BCE. So since he lived about a century after the Buddha, he probably would have known people who knew people who knew the Buddha. In other words, it's not that far away from the Buddha's own lifetime. And Ashoka grew up as, as the grandson of the great uh, Chandragupta Maurya, who was one of the, the most important kings of India at that time, uh, who basically unified the northern part of India. And in Ashoka's reign and, and the reign of others after him, they, they then started unifying part of the south. And indeed, this warfare was critical to Ashoka's own development because he made war against uh, Kalinga, or what's modern-day Odisha, and won a great battle. But apparently, uh, after, that, after that war, after that battle, he was uh, really shocked by the carnage that, that, that occurred in a warfare, and, and it really shook him to his core. At least that's what he tells us. And at that point, he decided to convert to Buddhism. He decided to give up uh, fighting. He decided to uh, basically aim towards a pacifism rather than towards warfare. And this is when uh, Emperor Ashoka basically became uh, Buddhism's uh, Emperor Constantine, if you like. If we know something about the history of the West, uh, Christianity was a relatively small kind of a belief system, a religion, until, uh, you know, sort of inf infiltrating uh, ancient Rome, until the time that Emperor Constantine decided to convert to Christianity. And at that point, it became something that was not only acceptable, but almost, you know, beneficial to become a Christian at the higher levels of, of the Roman intelligentsia. So a similar kind of thing happened uh, with Buddhism in India, at least as far as we know. The evidence is sketchy, but certainly Ashoka uh, did uh, apparently send around emissaries to uh, many different parts of the world. He installed a Buddhism in, in Sri Lanka, where it persists to this day, by sending emissaries to Sri Lanka and elsewhere. And of course, he put up uh, pillars all around uh, India, all around India extolling various of his beliefs, which we'll get to. And the great scholar of this early material, Richard Gombrich, believes that Ashoka got the idea for these uh, pillars and inscriptions from King Darius of the Achaemenid Empire of, of ancient Iran, that because King Darius basically fought many, many wars, and he put up many uh, texts uh, engraved into stone around his empire, basically uh, extolling his own victories and talking about his conquests and what a great general he was and what a great king he was. It may be that in response to that, or at least with that as an idea, King Ashoka decided to do the same kind of thing, except that instead of extolling his conquest in, in warfare, he extolled his conquest in dharma, in, in, in ethics, in, in doing the right thing which is completely changing the whole idea. In the same way that many of us will know, the Buddha himself famously used to take words and concepts out of uh, other competing belief systems, such as Brahmanism or Jainism, and twist them to his own use. So for the Buddha, a Brahmin, instead of being somebody of a particular caste, became somebody who acts properly, and so on. But when, I think the critical question here for us is that when Ashoka talks about victories in Dharma, what does he mean by Dharma? Okay, um, and here is, I think, really, really interesting. Because what, what Ashoka means by Dharma is something that is, I think, a sort of a, a secular ethics in the same way that uh, the Dalai Lama nowadays has talked about expanding a sort of a secular ethics that's, uh, that's applicable and 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 understandable and acceptable by many, or by, by most. So what, what Ashoka says when it comes to Dharma is, what he means is, little evil, much good, kindness, generosity, truthfulness, and purity. And again, those are the kinds of, of ethical aims that I think uh, all of us can have, no matter what uh, sect we belong to or whether we belong to any sect at all. 
we, we can all agree on these kinds of aims. And I think that was exactly what, what Ashoka was after. And we'll get, get to reasons for why I think this as we, as we get further along. Ashoka also said in, in one of his, uh, in one of his, his texts, uh, again, all these are written in stone that he had engraved in stone, so he really wanted people to be able to read them for long periods of time. They were very important to him, clearly. And in one of the texts, he says that, that a progress in Dharma can be achieved in two ways. It can be achieved by rules, by laying down the law, if you like, or it can be achieved by, by conviction, by, by coming to, to agree with them by your own internal investigation. And what Ashoka says is that the rules count for very little, that all of the progress that you make is by conviction. And, I, and this is another way, I think, that Ashoka's, that Ashoka's aim here in, in disseminating the Dharma was very modern. He knew that he had uh, a great deal of power and that he could, to an extent, uh, force people to do things the way he wanted them to. But he knew that that was going to be of little benefit, that, that forcing people, if you force people, they're not going to do it when you're not looking. And so what needs to happen is that people need to be convinced. And so to an extent, this is why he uh, produced these, these texts and, and these stelae, these, these engraved texts around India, was to try to convince people, was to have his reasoning out in the open. Another thing that the Ashoka does is to contrast uh, ritual and dharma. Um, he, he, he discusses uh, rituals, the kind of standard rituals that would have, we would have seen in his day, Rituals about sickness, about, uh, about uh, marriage, about childbirth, about going off on journeys. So you would have had various ceremonial rituals that you would have gone through, uh, perhaps prayers, perhaps uh, invocations of deities, perhaps sacrifices, whatever it would be, that were supposed to get you some aim. And what Ashoka says is that those uh, rituals are of little benefit, that sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work, and that even if they work, all that they get you is worldly aims. They, they don't get you uh, to the greater aims of ethics. And here I think he's, he's, he's reflecting something that uh, people have often called uh, Protestant Buddhism, but it, it, it occurs here at the very, very earliest parts of, of Buddhist history. What Ashoka does is to say that the real ritual is the ritual of Dharma. In other words, the, the ritual that we really should look to is the ritual of generosity towards one another and of nonviolence. And I think in this sense he's also very much echoing the words of the Buddha himself who would have said something very similar, in fact did say things that were very similar, saying basically that the, the rituals you find in uh, Brahmanism were uh, not useful on their own, uh, but what was useful was the ritual of Dharma. I mean he would have said something almost identical. Now, I mean, I should be clear that uh, Ashoka has nothing against rituals. He says that it's good to perform rituals. He simply says that they aren't of much benefit, that if you want to have real benefit, you should be uh, focusing on the, the true rituals, if you like, the deeper ones of, of generosity and of, of nonviolence. Now, when it comes to nonviolence, of course, uh, Ashoka was famously um, uh, pacifist, but he also extended that in large part to animals in the sense that he was against, he was clearly against ritual violence. He was against uh, these kind of ritual sacrifices that you had during festivals. He was against that kind of festival. Uh, and he was against sort of the, the ritual mistreatment of animals of any kind. And he certainly um, also seems to have forbade the, the sacrifice or the killing of, of certain kinds of animals. It, it may be all kinds of animals, so that's not quite as clear, but certainly his nonviolence was, was quite universal. And as far as generosity goes on his own, for his own sake, sake he talks in one of his, one of the still, I, one of the, the, these texts, about how he planted medicinal herbs that would have been useful for both uh, people and animals in places that they didn't exist. He talks about uh, digging wells. He talks about uh, planting mango groves so that people could eat the mangoes. He talks about planting uh, shade trees along roads. And he talks about building rest houses along the roads. So these are all ways that he was expending, as it were, his, his treasure, the treasure of his, of his kingdom, in order to make people's lives better. And he's making the point to the public that this is the way that he's being generous. And another way that, that uh, Ashoka was modern, very modern in his approach to the Dhamma, to the Dharma, and a way that he really resonates nowadays in, in a way that almost no other person of his age or centuries around resonates, is that he talks very much uh, against 
uh, religious or uh, other, other kinds of intolerance. He says, uh, don't praise your own sect, your own belief system, or, or denigrate immoderately uh, the belief systems of people that you disagree with. Because he says that only makes your, system, your, your belief system look bad. Uh, and by immoderately, I, I'm sure that what he means is, look, it's, it's fine to say that you don't agree with somebody, uh, and it's fine to give reasons, but you don't want to make a big deal out of it. Because that only makes, makes things worse for everybody, makes yourself look bad. And elsewhere, Ashoka writes, he says that he doesn't value gifts and honors as much as he values this, that there should be growth in the essentials of all the sects. And by all the sects, he pretty much means uh, Brahmanism and Jainism and Buddhism and uh, Ajivakaism, possibly, but other, other sects that were around that day. So, so basically what he's saying is that people from the sects, uh, these different sects, probably wanted to give him honors and gifts because he was the king. And what he's saying is that that doesn't matter to him. What matters to him is that they do, do good, that they grow in the way that is essential to them. And we might ask, and I think uh, it is important to ask, what he means by the essentials of these sects. What is he after that grows? And what he's after, again, is this we might call kind of a secular ethics. Because elsewhere in one of the other texts he, he writes, all sects should reside everywhere, for all of them desire self-control and purity of heart. So what he's, basically what he's saying is that self-control, which is another word for generosity or not being greedy, and purity of heart, which is another way of saying non-violence and non-anger and non-hatred, these are the kinds of aims that we should aim for. And these are, I think, the very basis of what we might call an enlightened secular ethics. Now, when I say secular, I've said secular a few times here, there are two ways of understanding secular, and I think people get hung up on the first way. The first way that we might mean the word secular is as something that's in opposition to religion, that's anti-religious. And that is, uh, that is, to be fair, uh, the way it is used sometimes, the word. But that's not the way I'm using it here. Um, by, by secular, I don't mean anti-religious, I don't mean something that's uh, in opposition to religion. What I mean is secular in the second sense. Secular in the second sense is a, a notion of opening up a space where people of differing viewpoints, differing uh, religious or non-religious viewpoints, differing sects, however you like to put it, can come together in a space of, of mutual tolerance and, and mutual acceptance, at least insofar as we can. And this is the sense in which we can say uh, contemporary Western governments are secular governments. They're not, they don't allow the dominance of one particular kind of sect or one particular kind of viewpoint, but they allow an open space for viewpoints to flourish from different, from different, uh, different people from different backgrounds. And I mean, it's clear uh, from these texts also that, that, that Ashoka was a Buddhist, that he had Buddhist beliefs. I mean, some, some, there are some scholars who, who call that into question, who say that it's not entirely clear that he was Buddhist, but I think they're in the, 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 the minority here. Um, I would say it's clear he's a Buddhist given many of the texts. He has texts about, again, splitting the Sangha, which is very, very important in Buddhism, especially at his time. So in, in you know, certainly in part of his life, he was, he was a committed uh, Buddhist practitioner. But in much of the public aspect of, of his rule, he was uh, perhaps the first really secular governor uh, of, a, of, of, a, of a country or of, a, of an area in the sense of allowing, um, not only allowing people from different backgrounds to flourish, but doing it in a very self-conscious way, which is unusual. And these ideas do arise from the Buddha. In other words, it's not that Ashoka was doing something uh, completely new here. In the Upali Sutta, the Buddha talks to a Brahmin convert, uh, who, a, a, I'm sorry, a Jain convert, a Jainist uh, who, who converted to Buddhism, to, to following the Buddha, and the Buddha tells him to continue to support and be generous to his Jain teachers, because he has done it in the past, uh, and because it's good to be, to be generous. And the Buddha um, emphasizes in that text and other texts that he's not an exclusivist. He doesn't say that you should only give to Buddhists, that you should only be good to Buddhists. He says you should, be, you should give to anybody uh, who you find ethical, and um, you know that he has nothing against giving to other teachers. And I have actually a talk on this, which I'll, I'll put a link to up above if you're interested in hearing more about the Buddha's own kind of viewpoint here. So what we see in Ashoka is an emphasis on a kind of a uni universalizable secular ethics as versus I would say a sort of a, sect, a, 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 a focus on sectarian uh, religious uh, ceremony and ritual. The sectarian ritual ceremonies, he says, are fine, but 
of not a great benefit. What is a great benefit is the secular ethics that's universalizable, this notion of kindness and compassion and generosity. And indeed, those are the hallmarks of Ashokan ethics, this focus on, on nonviolence, this focus on generosity, and this focus on the non-clinging to views, on the tolerance of viewpoints that are different from your own. That is that, that kind of tolerance, that kind of secular tolerance, that kind of creation of what we might call in Greek the agora, is one of the real hallmarks of, of Ashokan ethics. And, in, and it reflects, in many ways, what contemporary Dalai Lama is arguing for as well nowadays in a couple of his recent books. And I have, a, again, a talk on that, which uh, you should look at if you're interested in, in hearing what the Dalai Lama has to say in, in a similar kind of vein. So if you're interested in further tidbits on this topic and other kinds of things and interested in supporting the channel, check out my Patreon page. It's, it's linked here on the screen. Uh, thanks so much for being here. I always uh, love all your comments and questions. If you have other comments or questions, please also put them down below, and we'll catch you on the next one of these videos. So thanks so much, and be well.